But first, I'm off to meet the artistic director of this year's Brighton Festival, legendary producer and artist Brian Eno. Eno's not only curating the festival, he's also exhibiting his artwork and performing some compositions. But it was his lecture on the purpose of art that intrigued me. In fact, what I'll be talking about is why do we do art and why are we interested in looking at it? Why, why should anybody want to engage with the activity of art, or either as a producer of it or as a consumer of it? Do you mean visual art or do you encompass no, I, everything. Art, everything? It I, could be theatre or anything. It could be cake decoration. So um, what's, your, what's your answer? I mean, do you, is, is it encapsulatable? Since all cultures do this, uh, since we, we don't know of cultures that don't engage in stylistic behaviour at quite complicated levels, um, I, I have to see it as, a, as a, an adaptive biological form of behaviour. I, I remember a few years ago I saw this extraordinary object in a museum. It was a, it was a stone 80,000 years old, mm. which is 50,000 years before the caves were yes. painted. Yes. And it was a decorated object. Yes. So, and, 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 and I remember thinking, my God, you know, whoever did this, they mm. decorated it. So it bears out your idea that it's, it's actually part of our DNA, it's part yes. of our biology. Well, as soon as humans have time and leisure, they start ornamenting. And, you know, ornamentation is the beginning of what we finally call fine art. So I think that the kinds of things that are happening in our brain when we engage in art, as either as producers or consumers, are something that our brains need to do. And I think one of the experiences of art is, is the re-engagement with surrender, with not being me in control over everything, but letting go. How is that reflected in your own work? I mean, what, for example, these rather intriguing speaker flowers, are they, a, are they a manifestation, in some sense, of this, of this idea? Well, I think, I think one of the things that you want to do as an artist is to create something that makes people go, ah, oh, wow, I've never felt that before. Um, and that feeling of, of letting yourself experience something new is, is the central experience of art, I think, really, that, the, that you allow yourself to be in a psychologically new place without being too threatened by it. So, from contemporary art in Brighton to the art of the English Renaissance, and Montacute House in Somerset currently has an exhibition of portraits with a twist. Nobody knows who the sitters are. Now, it's said that every picture tells a story, but in the case of these mysterious paintings, the question is, which story? I went along to investigate. Montacute House has been described as the most beautiful Elizabethan house in all of England. It has something of the look of a jewellery box enlarged to the size of a mansion. And it's in the upper compartment of this stone casket of a house that a truly intriguing collection of Elizabethan and Tudor portraits can be found. Thanks to a deal with the National Trust, London's National Portrait Gallery houses some of its best 16th and 17th century portraits here at Montacute House. They've got all the celebrities of the age. Henry, Elizabeth, and Mary. But I'm here today on a mystery tour, because just now the NPG also has a special exhibition drawn from their collection of anonymous portraits, which are normally never displayed. Now, the story behind this gallery of anonymous individuals is a rather sad one, because in every case, the National Portrait Gallery bought these pictures because they believed them to be of certain individuals. In every case, those identities, those attributions of these pictures have been called into question, and that means that many of them have languished in the museum's basements for decades, if not longer than that. Yes, we might not know who these people are, but aren't they fascinating individuals? Look at this chap with his slightly red, maybe drinker's nose, a bit of sadness in his eyes, and something rather heartfelt about that expression in his hand. To complement the exhibition, the National Portrait Gallery has commissioned seven writers to create fantasy backstories for each of these figures. Julian Fellows imagines a sorrowful widow whose husband was executed by Henry VIII. Terry Pratchett conjures up the tale of an ambitious but painfully stupid explorer. And author Tracy Chevalier writes both about an Elizabethan noblewoman and this flushed young courtier. I am still wearing the white brocade doublet Caroline gave me. It has a high, 
plain collar, detachable sleeves, and intricate buttons of twisted silk thread set close together so that the fit is snug. I first wore it at an elaborate dinner her parents held in our honor. I knew even before I stood up to speak that my cheeks were inflamed. I've always flushed easily, from physical exertion, from wine, from high emotion. As a boy, I was teased by my sisters and by schoolboys, but not by George. Only George could call me Rosie. I would not allow anyone else. He managed to make the word tender. He said it described not just my cheeks, but my lips as well, smooth and crimson as rose petals. So Tracy, what did you think when you were invited to play this game of speculation? Oh, I loved it. Well, it's what I've done before with uh, my novel, Girl with a Pearl Earring, is a whole novel speculating about the identity and the biography of this girl in a Vermeer painting we know nothing about. So when the National Portrait Gallery asked me to write a short story, I thought, fantastic. I love bringing to life an unknown face. When I made the announcement, George did not turn rosy, but went pale as my doublet. He should not have been surprised. It has been a common assumption that I would one day marry his cousin. But it is difficult to hear the words aloud. I know I could barely utter them. It's a remarkable and little-known fact that the National Portrait Gallery has over a hundred of these mysterious pictures in its vaults. How on earth did all these people lose their identities? I met the exhibition's curator, Tanya Cooper, who specialises in these artistic enigmas. So are they sort of in an art gallery version of Limbo? <laughs> it's very, very hard to re-stitch together the identity of a sitter once that is lost because it relies on all sorts of documents. It relies on sometimes an inscription or likeness to an existing portrait, which in many cases, this might be the only portrait of this person was ever painted. Not only is he unknown, but he's unknown by an unknown artist, which makes me think, well, couldn't the painters have done something? There are so few artists who are actually going to sign their names. That they're just not of that sort of status. You would be paid a certain fee, but you'd also have to register that fee with the Painter Stainers Guild, and you'd have a stamp put on the back. And so there may be a reason why they're not signing a work <laughs> to avoid that fee. I see. So it's like cash in hand a bit, you know. Oh, I won't put that one through the books. Essentially, yeah. But tell me about this picture, because I would have imagined in my naive way that there are actually quite a lot of clues Absolutely. here. I mean, there's an inscription, there's a coat of arms, but he's just untraceable. We took this to the College of Arms, and when they looked at their coat of arms, we don't think this is a real coat of arms. Something very odd is going on here, because... So is it possible, is it possible that he might be pretending to be someone he doesn't seem to be? It's quite possible that he may be doing that. And there's a, you know, this is a really interesting time in social mobility, because what you can do, portraits have a key role to play in this, is that you can do all sorts of clever things to present your identity in a slightly different way. You can purport to be a gentleman. You can do this. There are fines for doing this, but it may be exactly what this sitter is doing. You know, they're, they're still remarkable people and remarkable paintings. It's just we don't know who they represent. I'm not sure why I agreed to let William draw me. I certainly did not want a painting of me. Not now. A drawing then, he said. That is all. One I can keep in my studio for the model of a dignified lady. Of course, William has been good friends with my husband and has been so kind to me since his death and my son's. But I could have put him off longer, said I was too full of grief and too weak for my own illness. Perhaps I simply wanted the companionship of a man again, to sit with him and talk to him while he drew. To distract others from my ravaged looks, I've worn my widest collar and the topaz necklace Henry gave me after Harry's birth. Good girl, he'd whispered as he hung it around my neck. Well done. Now he and Harry are gone, leaving my daughter and me alone a household of women in a world of men. At least my daughter is healthy. This is really the very first time that the National Portrait Gallery has chosen to put on display pictures from its secret collection, its basement full of unknown and anonymous sitters. And it makes me think that they should really do it more often. After all, why should our history of ourselves visually simply be made up of the great and the good, kings and queens? In many ways, I think when you don't know the name of a sitter in a portrait, it makes you look at that portrait all the more carefully. And perhaps you end up finding out more about their identity and their personality than if you really did know their name. 
So I say, yes, the ruddy-cheeked poet, the dodgy guy with the coat of arms that isn't his own, I think they should be part of our history of ourselves. Long live the unremembered dead. <laughs>